Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our webinar today, and I hope that you find the information that we're presenting useful. My name is Kara Hansen. I'm the Program Director for the Global Health Research Program at NIHR. The, um, the NIHR was established in 2006 um, to be the main kind of research and innovation arm of the United Kingdom's Department of Health and Social Care. Um, the, the, the main NIHR program focuses on research in England and the United Kingdom, but in 2016, we also became a major funder of applied global health research in low and middle income countries funded through UK aid from the United Kingdom government. Uh, you can see that uh, we, um, we are that new logo on the right hand side, so funding applied global health research is a core part of NIHR's mission, and we do this in ways that is entirely consistent with the, the balance of the NIHR's mission around funding high quality research, investing in expertise, working in close partnership with patients, carers, and communities, attracting and supporting the best researchers, and collaborating with others to shape a, a globally competitive research system. The strategic priorities for the current period, which runs from 2021 to 25, are outlined here in this slide. So um, our overall aim is to generate high quality applied global health research and training to address the unmet health needs of people in low and middle income countries. We have three major areas of research focus. One is addressing the shifting global burden of disease. Second is to develop health systems to identify and respond to population health needs. And the third is to build resilience to tackle future global health threats. All of this is done through, um, through research that at the same time strengthens research capacity in both low and middle income countries and the United Kingdom. And it's also underpinned by our principles. And this is really important. So the research that we fund is always and everywhere promoting community engagement and involvement throughout the research. Um, it is delivered through equitable partnerships. And um, it's also driven by, by ensuring that, um, that the research that we fund eventually has an impact on population health. Earlier this year, we refreshed our global health research portfolio uh, with the explicit aim of enhancing clarity, predictability, and equity. So by clarity, um, this means that we have, um, we have uh, developed a couple of new programs that combine some of our older funding streams. And in particular, we have a new, um, a new combined global health uh, policies and systems call and a researcher-led call that combines the old groups and units programs. And through these, um, these mergers of old programs, we hope to be able to support researchers to find the program that best suits their research question, their experience, and their ambition. All global health research programs, with the exception of global health research centers, will now run on an annual cycle at the same time every year. And this should make it easier for researchers to plan ahead and develop their, um, their applications. Uh, and I think this is this is really important also for research quality. So if you get to you know a month or two from the deadline and you think that my proposal isn't really quite fully baked, you can rest easy that there um, there should be another call at the same next year, same time next year, so that you can work it up um, in more detail and increase your chances of success. We've also significantly adapted the leadership model so that more researchers from low and middle income countries can access global health research funding. So in our early days, it was always necessary to have a UK lead or co-lead. From now onwards, none of our global health research projects require a UK lead. And I'll describe that partnership model in a little bit more detail shortly. So this is what our new portfolio looks like. We have basically two different types of funding, those that fall in the category of researcher-led. 
So um, this is where researchers come up with the topics in collaboration, close collaboration with policymakers and program managers in their countries, um, but develop the topic um, uh, themselves. And then we have our strategic or thematic, as in the bottom bands, calls where there is a, a themed call that we invite researchers to respond to. So amongst our researcher-led streams, we have um, our development awards, which run once a year now and are, uh, are um, available to low and middle income country researchers and research teams for money to develop a high quality proposal for one of our larger schemes. We have our flagship professorships awards. This is to support outstanding academics who are at the professorial level to develop their team and develop a high quality research program of global relevance. We have our new global advanced fellowships. This is aimed at the level below the professors. So anywhere from kind of pro, uh, postdoc through to pre-prof, and these are individual awards as well, fellowships. And then we have the program that we're going to talk about today, which is our researcher-led pro program. In the thematic awards, we have our global um, health research centers. These have only run once so far on a specific theme. We have our health policy and systems research stream. And then we have Write, uh, which is our research on interventions for global health transformation. And every year that runs with a specific thematic call. Mm -hmm. So up till now, we have developed a, a large and significant portfolio of funded research that involves more than 300 different institutions that works in more than 50 countries and has um, provided more than a thousand low and middle income country researchers support to progress their careers. So one thing that is new with this new researcher-led program is that um, it is presented in terms of three different funding bands. So the idea here is that there will be annual regular um, calls for proposals, that these are researcher-led. This means that you can apply for funding for research topics of your choice where you can justify that these have been identified in collaboration with local stakeholders. And this award now runs um, with three bands of funding available. So you can choose the band that best meets your research experience and ambition. Um, and then finally, that there's a, a flexible leadership model um, that should support equitable partnerships. So uh, research funding band one is the largest. This is for, um, for established research partnerships and experienced teams. It is particularly for ambitious, broad, large, significant programs of research and capacity strengthening. Band two is the middle band. It's at a lower funding level. And this is for either for developing or less mature partnerships that have varying levels of experience, um, but also where people are proposing a, a new program of research, extending existing research, and or including more LMIC settings than in previous than in previous research. Finally, research band three is our smallest, lowest band. This is directed at new partnerships, less experienced teams, or for projects that are at an, an earlier or developmental stage without a higher degree of risk. So this table outlines the requirements across the three funding bands. So you can see down the vertical axis, we have the band one, two, and three, and you can see the funding ranges attached to each funding band. So band one is between four and seven million pounds. Band two is two to four million pounds. And band three is from 250,000 pounds up to two million pounds. These bands differ in terms of the length of the awards. So the smallest band, band three, is for projects for up to three years, while the largest band, one, is for projects of up to five years. You can see in the third column that we are planning to fund across the range of bands. So we, we've given um, an estimate of the number of wards that we expect to fund in each of these three bands. Think carefully about this because um, we will want to be looking at programs that are choosing the right band. The leadership model is important. So for the smallest bands, it is possible to have a single lead 
or joint leads um, who come from separate institutions. That is the only band where a sole lead is possible. And if you are applying in band three as a sole lead, you must be from a low or middle income country. For, um, for both bands two and one, because these are more ambitious, larger, more complex programs of work, we, we expect there to be a joint leadership model where this can either be two low and middle income country leads from separate institutions, or it can be a low and middle income country and UK co-leadership model. So you can see that LMIC leadership is possible across all three awards. Um, we would normally expect for the largest awards for research to take place in at least two countries. And uh, for the smaller bands, this could be research that takes place in one or more countries. Um, you can see the number of separate institutions we expect to be involved. So for the smallest band, band three, it can be a single institution that applies. But for the larger bands, we do expect consortia to be applying. And finally, um, these awards all differ in terms of the ambition of training within them. So for the lowest band, we don't expect um, there to be formal training posts, that's MSc or postdocs. We don't require it. If you do include them, it must be the case that these programs can be completed within that, um, that project duration, which is only after three years. Uh, for the bands two and three, you can see we are expecting increasing numbers of academic training posts for MSc um, and postdocs. So I hope that helps to clarify uh, what we mean by the bands and helps, to, helps you to think through what is the most appropriate band for you to be applying for. I'm now going to turn over to um, Sarah Puddicum from the NIHR, Assistant Director for Global Health Research, to continue to describe the different, um, the, the different elements of the researcher-led program. Thanks very much. Hello, thank you so much, Cara, for that introduction to our new Global Health Researcher-led programs. I'm Dr. Sarah Puddicum. I'm Assistant Director for Research Programs at the NIHR Coordinating Centre. And I'm going to talk to you about uh, the eligibility and the selection criteria that we'll be using to assess your applications to our Global Health Researcher-led programs. And a really warm welcome to all of you who are joining us around the globe today. I'm going to start with uh, our researcher-led leadership model. Now, as Cara has explained, we have three funding bands. And if you're applying in our band three, then we are, you are eligible to apply as a sole lead if you're employed in an eligible ELMIC institution. However, please note that we do not accept sole leads from UK institutions. However, across all of our bands from band one to band three, we do encourage and um, uh, for you applying as joint leads. Now, we expect that one of you must be employed by an eligible uh, ELMIC institution. And then you have the choice as to whether the other joint lead is employed by a different eligible ELMIC institution or, or an eligible UK institution. Please be aware that if you're a UK applicant planning to apply, you can only apply in equitable partnerships with an ELMIC joint lead organisation. So in terms of eligibility for joint lead institutions, eligible institutions are higher education institutes, research institutes, or non-government organizations which meet our eligibility criteria. Now our eligibility criteria state that you have to be able to uh, obtain competitive research and research capacity funding, and to be able to have a track record of the successful delivery of research and capacity strengthening activities including formal training, such as masters or PhDs. Now, the awards that we manage are very complex and you need to have effective governance, the financial and research support services, such as uh, intellectual property and procurement, 
financial reporting uh, and the ability to manage expenditure, provide quarterly reports and manage budget environments and respond to audit requirements. A very important factor is that institutions who are proposing themselves to be the contracting joint lead must be able to transfer funds for, to all of the partners listed uh, in the application. So it's really important that if you're proposing yourself as the joint lead contracting organization, that you're aware of any national restrictions that may prevent you transferring funds and have mitigations in place to allow you to facilitate the transfer of funds to all listed partners in your, in your proposal. We also do uh, have a requirement that if you are an affiliated organisation, so you're in an ELMIC and you're affiliated to a UK or a higher income country institute, that you really must be able to demonstrate legal independence from the affiliated institute. Now, a marker of that is, tends to be that if you're working with another joint lead, you will require to have a collaboration agreement with that joint lead institute. We, we do require that all ELMIC, uh, any affiliated institute must be able to sign a contract directly and it must not have to go through another intermediary or partner organisation. If you have any concerns, please do contact our team and we'll be willing to really help you talk through and understand the arrangements such that we can advise you on your eligibility. In terms of co-applicants listed on your application, you can include uh, co-applicants from anywhere in the world. And this can include non-ELMIC countries. But when you do include individuals from high income countries, please do justify how the expertise that you're calling on cannot be found within an ELMIC and how the approach that you're planning and this expertise will really directly be of benefit to ELMIC institutions. The application requires you also to state how you meet our ODA eligibility requirement. So in your application, please carefully outline which countries on the OECD DAC list will be directly benefiting as a consequence of your research proposal and how through your application, you will be contributing to addressing the development challenges of those countries and how the outcomes of your research will ultimately promote the health and welfare of individuals living in countries on the OECD DAC list. Now we've got uh, really some comprehensive guidance uh, uh, linked through our application pages. So please do refer to our OODA guidance for researchers if you need more information. Now, NHL Global Health Research Programmes have a number of funding opportunities that um, are either open now or coming in the near future. If you're planning to apply, um, then please do be aware that we have a research on interventions for global health transformation or right call eight, which is specifically focused on addressing the global burden of unintentional injuries and accidents. Now that includes things such as falls, drowning, burns, poisoning, environmental heat and cold exposure and road traffic accidents. And that call is currently open now. If you're planning on applying to the researcher led call in this direct theme with a major focus on accidents and injuries, then I would recommend that you reconsider and look at our right call eight. If you're also planning to apply with a major focus on health policy and systems research, uh, that's research which is thinking about strengthening health services policies and in the understanding and effectiveness of health systems in low middle income countries, then I recommend you reconsider and think about applying to our next call, which will be opening in spring of 2025. That said, if you're planning to put in a research proposal that has an element 
of accidents and injuries or an element of health post policy and systems research, then you would be eligible to apply to our researcher-led call, which is open now. If you're not sure, again, please do talk to us. The team are really willing to help to advise you. And if you do submit a call, submit to our call and we then look at it and think that actually your application would be better suited to another call, then we will reserve the right to transfer your application to that, uh, to that other call. If you're thinking about submitting multiple applications, then it really is worth taking note of the fact that NIHR will not accept the same or substantially similar applications being submitted in parallel to different uh, global health calls. If you're submitting an application, you really must make sure, with which has the same team, you really must make sure that you're making substantially different proposals with different aims, research proposals, and have considered sort of a different leadership model so that you're really supporting um, our ethos for developing and uh, new leadership and future leadership development. If you're thinking as a research institute of submitting multiple applications to this researcher-led program call, then please be advised that any one individual should only be named once as a joint or a sole lead on an application. That doesn't preclude that individual from being a co-applicant on any other application to this funding opportunity. Now, higher education institutes and research institutes can submit more than one application to this call, but each application has to be different in its, of its aims and objectives, should have a different joint or sole lead, and do please be aware that we will not intend to fund more than three uh, awards per joint or sole lead institute. And if you're submitting multiple applications, think about the diversity in the leadership model. Um, think about the gender balance of the leaders that you're proposing across your as joint leads across your proposal from any one institute and ensure that you're you're looking at that equity and balance in terms of gender. So I'm now going to run through, I've talked through the eligibility criteria and I'm going to run through the selection criteria that we use for stage one for the shortlisting uh, of the proposals that are submitted. We will be looking through with the committee's uh, advice at the relevance of the research, of the research being proposed, of the research quality and its excellence, looking at the strength of the research team that's being proposed, and ultimately at the potential impact and sustainability of that research. Now I'm going to run through in a little bit more detail about our expectations for each of these criteria. So in terms of one, the relevance of the proposed research, I really want you to think about how you can demonstrate to the committee that that research has been designed with ELMIC partners from the very outset and has really been based on a, a robust review of the local context and health systems and of the existing literature so that it's really set within the context in the research is uh, in the country that research is, uh, is based within. Please ensure that you demonstrate to the committee how the research will intend to fill a significant gap or address an, a significant unmet health need or priority within the odor eligible countries of concern and that you have met and will fully align with the scope of our call. It's really also an important aspect to think about how you will be enabling individuals and research institutes through both the research and the research capacity strengthening elements to produce relevant high quality evidence that can address the unmet needs in those, those countries that you're specifying. And it's really important that when you're doing that, that you've thought about engaging with the communities and the most vulnerable and marginalized uh, members of the, the population within the local context to ensure that you're addressing their needs and urgent priorities. 
In terms of our second criteria, when we're looking at research quality and excellence, we really are looking through the committee uh, to ensure that the research plan is robust and has very clear questions, objectives, and is soundly designed. Now, when you're writing your proposal, you may not have the fully detailed methodological approach that you intend to use, but wherever possible, give as much detail on the methodology as you can and on the approach that you will be planning to take so that you can reassure the committee that the research that you're proposing will ultimately adequately address the questions and meet the planned objectives. It's, it's really helpful to make sure that you include clear milestones and that you think through and articulate that you've identified and mitigated key risks and ethical considerations related to your research. The, the committee will also be looking for having appropriate plans and resources in place across the team. These are complex awards, so we are looking for a robust program uh, management, uh, robust governance, and clear support from the institution uh, in terms of the contract management, the financial management, and the reporting. So don't skimp on the resources that you feel you need to deliver these complex programs. It's really important that you've thought about things like your community engagement and your program management across the partners to ensure that you can meet uh, the needs for this type of complex research award. Uh, the third criteria is the strengths of the research team. And so it's really uh, key that you think about having an appropriate range and depth of relevant expertise. And we're really looking to have, make sure that you've got a really robust interdisciplinary way of working that will be able to uh, deliver on the methods and the approaches that you're planning to use. And if you're, if you're supporting more junior members of, uh, of the team, whether as a lead applicant or as a work stream lead, that there are appropriate mentoring arrangements in place to help support those less experienced researchers. Do you, however, think about the number of partners that you're managing? Because that adds to additional complexity. And... Um, that you have sufficient funds available to support the, the partners so that they make a meaningful contribution and that you're really leveraging the expertise in your ELMIC partners to the best possible uh, to, to, to the best possible means. Uh, and do please think about ensuring that you have appropriate community engagement, monitoring evaluation, social science and health economic expertise within the team as relevant to your research proposal. The fourth criteria is impact and sustainability. And the committee here will be looking for a real clear potential that the research outputs that you're producing will ultimately improve practice and inform policy. And we really want to, to know that those findings will be disseminated and support the future implementa implementation and the future sustainability of the research and the partnerships in those ELMIC countries beyond the end of the award. So think about a very clear and implementable strategy to achieve impact. How are you going to engage those key stakeholders? How are you involving communities? And how are you ensuring that that research will be ultimately taken up into practice and will be disseminated and, and ultimately uh, inf influence policy and practice. Once you've uh, been successfully shortlisted at stage one, then you will get a letter from the committee and be invited to uh, submit a stage two application. At stage two, we uh, assess not only the, uh, the criteria one to four that I've just discussed, but we also assess in detail capacity strengthening, community engagement and involvement, the equity of your partnerships and the value for money. But I can't underestimate enough that it's important to give a flavour of your intentions at the outline stage. 
So do give an indication of what capacity strengthening you're thinking of, the approach to community engagement and involvement, and how you're demonstrating equity of partnerships and value for money. Now, in terms of the capacity strengthening, you'll have seen from the uh, table that Cara described that there are different criteria for the different bands of funding. So we would be looking at ten, uh, at least 10 academic training posts for a band one award, uh, approximately four academic training posts for a band two award. And it's optional as to whether you include capacity strengthening in um, in your band three award. But any uh, formal training that you intend to do should be completed within the lifetime of the award that you're proposing. If you're thinking about community engagement, we strongly recommend you think about engaging with vulnerable and marginalized groups and ensure that relevant breadth of engagement to include policymakers, communities, patients and the public, the NGOs and civil society and charities, so that you really are engaging with uh, the communities where the research most matters and that can help uh, with the dissemination in impact of that, of that research. In terms of the equity of the partnerships, uh, then I, I really strongly recommend that you think about ensuring um, the balance of the research includes, you know, equity in terms of the leadership, equity in terms of the government governance of that research, in, in the distribution of the funds, thinking about the ethics, the data, uh, the intellectual property, and the dissemination of the findings. We really are looking for partnerships, really having a strong underpinning research ethic involving mutual respect, understanding for different cultural, ethnic, social and economic beliefs and practices, and that you can articulate that in your award. And then finally, in terms of the value for money, um, we do expect that um, you will show some benefit in terms of the, um, the efficiency, the effectiveness uh, of the research, um, the economy and the equity, please. I think a, a final comment on the equity of the partnerships that I haven't mentioned already is that we do expect the balance of the funding to go where the majority of, of the work is taking place and that you are really maximizing the expertise that exists in low middle income country partners uh, in terms of their management and leadership of, of the awards. We also uh, then expect um, there's a range of different um, bands of funding that you can apply for from band one, which is the highest, which it goes up to 7 million for a period of five years, down to the lowest of about 250,000 pounds for up to three years at a band three award. When you're submitting and thinking about your finance, we only require an overall cost in your stage one application. Now, we appreciate that it takes some effort and time to be able to consider that overall cost. Um, but we also uh, do want you to consider that the balance in the flow of funds between any uh, high income and low, uh, low middle income countries really does reflect where the majority of that work is being taken place. We largely expect that that will be within the LMIX, but we do appreciate that that is not always the case and that there are some good justifications for why funding may need to flow through other partners for the direct benefit of the low middle income country partners. So if you're if that is the case, please, ju please just justify how that funding will benefit the LMIX ultimately. Um, and just as a word of um, uh, reminder, please think that you can uh, include a responsive line to address the emerging needs um, within your award of up to 5% of the total budget. You can also think about uh, additional methodological uh, requirements that might support your award of a similar uh, amount of up to 5% of the total budget. 
but please do refer to our finance guidance for further details. And if you have particular questions pertinent to your individual awards, then do please contact us and we can give you further advice. So if you're curious about what other awards the NIHR have funded in this space, then we do have a website where we uh, publish details on all of the awards that we funded, those that have completed and those that are active. Uh, you can see listings of the different partner countries that are involved, and those are available on our NIHR funding and awards website and via our NIHR open data platform. So if you'd like to see more information on the types of awards we funded and where they're based and uh, potentially even if you're looking for other research partners and you want to connect up with people who are already funded and working on our awards, then please do go through this website, these websites uh, to, to try and connect up as you see fit and to understand some of the research that we fund. So that's really wrapped up uh, the sort of eligibility and the selection criteria. And I'm going to now be handing over to Dr. Rushi Baxi, who's going to talk to you about what makes a really good stage one application. So thank you very much. And I wish you all the very best in your application. And I will be handing over to Rushi uh, now. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. So uh, introducing myself, I'm Ruchi Baxi. I'm a consultant in public health medicine uh, and I work for NIHR as a consultant advisor to um, funding programmes, including the Re Global Health Research Programme. And I'm going to talk to you today about what makes a good stage one application. And these, the content of this part of the webinar is based on observations by myself and my colleagues um, who, as consultant advisors, um, sit on funding committees as non-voting members. So we have the opportunity to view the discussion and deliberations that take place. Uh, and we've pulled out some, some key themes here. So a quick reminder of the application process, but I won't dwell on this too much uh, to save time for the rest of the content. And um, this is a two stage application process, of course, with the stage one application being assessed by the sta stage one committee and those um, applications that go ahead and um, likely to have um, feedback to address where they do go ahead uh, and a longer application form with more criteria as outlined by Sarah for the stage two application which is then again assessed by the committee. So I'm going to talk to you in three parts um, today. So the first part is discussing selling the idea um, for the application, then secondly, selling the methodology, and then finally thinking about some common challenges that arise. So coming to that first part around selling the idea, it's important to really show why this research is needed and why now. And um, so, so doing that sales pitch around the importance of the research and justifying that with evidence so anything that's claimed here needs to be backed up by literature or other work that justifies why you've chosen to do this research. And that research should be locally grounded. So considering how the research um, um, would benefit people in that setting um, and, and indeed whether it can provide wider benefits. So it should the, you know, be a local priority to address those research questions with a clear pathway to, to those benefits, alongside discussing whether findings may be applicable to other settings, other low and middle income country contexts, or indeed high income country contexts as well. And as part of that sales pitch, it's also um, important to outline why your team is the best team to undertake this research. So demonstrating how the team as a whole has the has a breadth of expertise and skills required to undertake the research uh, across all of the various components that may be involved. So while in that 
first slide, I discussed selling the importance of the research and the credibility of the team to deliver the research. It's also important to do this in a balanced way, uh, in an evidence-based way, and avoid overstatement. So overclaiming what the team will be able to do or making the research sound over-important, as given the committee will be aware of the, the complexity and plethora of, of issues that are um, health issues that are um, need to be addressed in, in any particular context um, is also to be avoided. So having a, that balanced approach um, to developing that um, story around the importance of the research. And ensuring that you've done enough work, including reading, so that the, and that's demonstrated in the application, so it's visible to the committee, um, and that you have show you have an awareness of what else is going on in the field. So, so not leaving out other important research that's taken place that's of relevance or work that is ongoing, and um, that relates to to the topic that your um, application and research is looking to address. Um, and if there are big um, gaps or oversights that's the sort of thing that the committee will will note um, uh, and uh, it can undermine the credibility uh, appearance of credibility of the team um, and awareness and engagement of the team with the wider work that's going on in the field so thinking now about the next part and selling the methodology, the methodology um, of the research is, is, is scrutinized as an important part of the application process. So, so outlining how are you going to undertake the research? And, and the committee does recognize that the methodology for all aspects um, won't be fully set at this stage necessarily, and um, that um, there may be other important um, pieces of work that need to be done, for example, community engagement work or the sequential um, work within the research that builds and um, that where the methodology builds on what's happened before. But what needs to be evident is and, and convincing is that there's a clear plan for doing the research and how the methodology will be developed further as that um, progresses. And there needs to be justification for the chosen methodological approach. So again, with the underpinning evidence, and you'll note that that's a, a theme that comes up recurrently um, through this um, from the literature, from community engagement work that, that you may have done previously. So, so building on that point around community engagement, both community engagement and involvement and capacity building are vital parts of, of the Global Health, Health Research um, Program funding uh, and need to be evident within the applications. So they are more fully assessed um, as part of the stage two application criteria, as Sarah outlined, but it should be evident that they are present and, and a part, integral part of the research at stage one and um, so thinking about community engagement and involvement you know how will you out involve communities and stakeholders to ensure that the research is helpful to the community done in an appropriate way that accounts for community views and has a potential for that sustainable long-term impact and then coming to capacity building um, there are particular elements of um, capacity building that should be present. One thing the committee will be will be uh, attentive to is is that balance of the team. So thinking about who is going to do most of the work, what are the what is the balance of the team between uh, high income settings and low and middle income country settings? And committees do tend to favour when skills are mostly based in low and middle income country settings, where individuals in the team are from a high income country setting this would need to be justified and why those skills um were not um available in in the in the research setting or the low middle income country setting so that would need to be discussed and justified and you know how will this research build research capacity in um low middle income country setting or settings so coming to common challenges, and in some ways, this is the inverse of the, the former two parts on selling the idea and selling the methodology. So um, some common challenges, one is a potential lack of detail. So, so there is a delicate balance and, and we recognize it can be challenging to fit everything that you may want to say about um, 
the research topic and approach within the word count while making sure that there is sufficient detail and all, all of the key topics are covered. Um, so um, it's important to ensure that there's enough detail on the methodology such that it can be assessed um, by a funding committee to ensure it is an appropriate approach to, to, the, to um, addressing those research questions. And, and as I said earlier, if, if the methodology isn't finalised yet, you need to demonstrate that you'll be able to do so and there's a clear plan for doing so. And, and as part of optimising that word count and, and using it as, as well as you can, um, it's important to try not to repeat yourself and um, so that you can, um, so that that doesn't get in the way of um, putting other things in the application that, that are important as part of that assessment process. Another challenge is failing to justify statements. So as I've said a few times, um, it's important that underpinning evidence is provided for statements that are made, otherwise they are considered just an opinion, as is commonly said, um, rather than making those statements into, into fact. Um, and that's particularly important when, when, when you're providing that sort of balanced and justified account of why the research is important and um, but also you know why the methodology has been chosen etc um, it's important that you you're able to demonstrate that you have sufficient knowledge of the field or methods and um, so and not demonstrating that is is a potential um uh, issue that would be picked up by a funding committee. So, for example, if the statements around the methodology appear confused and not clear, where there are multiple approaches that are overlap and it's not clear what's going to be followed, and um, those those would be um, challenges. And and the committee um, has a um, diverse set of um, members. So some will be lay members, but some some will be experts in the field and. And of course, that, as you can anticipate, would be off-putting if, if there isn't that clear um, un understanding shown around the, the area, the field and the methods. Um, another another common challenge that could present itself is an unbalanced team. So um, uh, as I've mentioned previously, it, it, if the team doesn't show that they've got the expertise and the disciplines or areas that are central to the research, if there's a geographical bias with it uh, being unclear why, for example, there are lots of people from high income countries on in, in the team and not many people from low and middle income countries, then then that that would not be looked on favorably. So it's important to show that this is an appropriately balanced team with the right set of um, expertise to answer the research questions. And then finally, another common challenge is the uh, um, use of overly technical language. So it's really important that there's a clear narrative to the application uh, and that terminology that is present is explained, that um, excessive jargon is minimized. Um, so making it clear, plain English um, is, is really important so that it's very clear what you're proposing to do and what you hope it's going to achieve. Uh, and as I mentioned, the committee has a diversity of members. So while some will have expertise in your field, given that the researcher led call is a, uh, is a broad call with applications that will come in in a number of areas, There'll be other others that won't be from your field on the committee or indeed lay members. Uh, and if there's lots of jargon, it's very, very difficult for them to assess the application. And um, so um, it can be really hard if you're a, a, an expert in, in this area. It can be very difficult to even identify jargon because it's part of your day to day working language. So um, one potentially helpful tip is to test your application for clarity on lay friends or family um, who will perhaps more readily be able to pick out where something is um, confusing language or jargon or, or piece of um, technical terminology that need explaining. So um, I hope that was helpful. I'm now going to hand over to Faye Havens, who's going to talk more about the application process. Thank you, Rishi, for that helpful update. So I'm going to talk through now uh, some of the uh, application processes and give you some hints and tips 
So my name is Faye Havens. I'm a senior research manager at the NIHR Coordinating Centre, and it's myself and my team that will be helping you complete your applications and get everything done in the system. So, um, as has already been mentioned, uh, the Global Health Research-led funding opportunity will be a two-stage application process. Now, stage one is a shorter outline of your proposed research plan, and Rishi has done a great job explaining on how we ensure that this has all the information that we require. Um, and so this is to give you a bit of information of how your application will be assessed. So first of all, we undertake remit and eligibility checks, and these are carried out to ensure that your applications meet the criteria set out within the guidance, and it's eligible for the researcher-led opportunity. We also look at the eligibility of your contracting organisation, so please ensure you have checked this against the published criteria. All applications will also undergo a triage process, and this is carried out by a subset of the funding committee, and it manages the very high numbers of applications that we receive. Uh, we expect this first researcher-led funding opportunity to be particularly large, uh, but to reassure anyone that all applications that are declined at triage, triage will receive feedback. If you make it through the triage stage, you will have a review by the stage one funding committee and applications will be discussed to decide which ones are taken forward to stage two. And as mentioned, all applications that are declined or shortlisted to stage two will receive feedback. If you are declined, uh, this, is, this feedback is designed to be constructive and help you with your future applications. And if you are shortlisted, this will be things that you need to consider to include within your stage two application. Once submitted, stage two applications undergo further external peer review and applicants are given an opportunity to respond to the comments given by those reviewers uh, before their applications are seen by the stage two funding committee. So this slide gives a bit of a more visual guide as to what happens to your applications and when. So obviously the funding committee, the funding, committee, the funding opportunity is already open and we are having uh, the briefing event here today. So the next milestone is the call deadline on the 6th of November. All research led funding opportunities close at 1 p.m. and that is 1 p.m. UK time. Um, and as you can see, you should hear the outcomes of your stage one submission by February next year. And if you are successful to stage two, your submission would be due in June. So make sure you have time scheduled in your diary to complete those submissions if needed. We would be expecting any successful project to start in the first half of 2026. And it is important to note that we don't really have too much flexibility in those start dates. So the most important piece of advice I can give to anyone when they're applying to one of our funding opportunities is to take the time and read the guidance in full. Now we spend a lot of time ensuring as much information as possible is in these documents and they're there to help you. And I can't stress enough how important these documents are. So make sure you read the guidance and you will hear me say that a lot. Uh, there are, we understand, a lot of documents to read and it will take you a bit of time. So I'm going to break down what guidance we have and what it will tell you. So we have our remit guidance, which is specific for this funding opportunity, and it will give you the scope, eligibility and selection criteria and set out the timelines. We have the core guidance, which applies to all global health uh, funding opportunities run by NIHR and we aim to keep this regularly updated so even if you have read it before it's worth taking another look to make sure nothing has changed. There is application form guidance and these tell you what to put in what section of the form and how to complete the form within rounds. As this system is reasonably new some of you might not have used it yet so we hope that the instructions will help you navigate your way through. Uh, there's finance guidance, which will help you complete your full finance breakdown at stage two. But it is important at stage one because we expect your figures that you are be entering at stage one to be realistic include and include everything that you would expect to include. 
and committees don't expect to see a huge change in costs between stages one and two. We also supply a Word version of the application form so you can see what information you need to include and things like character counts and section headings without having to log into the system. It's important to note though that this form is provided as a guide only and cannot be submitted only applications received through rounds will be considered. Now this slide and these uh, slides will be circulated after this uh, briefing event gives a, a overview of where you can find information within the different guidance documents. Um, so I'm not going to go through it, but it'd be more helpful when you have the slides after the event. But for example, if you wanted to look at uh, where do I find information about my research contracts and uh, IP? That would be in the core guidance, as is shown here. So have I, as I've already mentioned, you must submit your application via rounds. And rounds will close at 1 p.m. and that is 1 p.m. UK time, don't forget. Late applications will not be accepted. And if you're experiencing issues using rounds or you're having other technical problems, you must let us know in good time. It's not possible for us to be able to help you two minutes before the deadline. So please don't leave it to the last minute to submit. At stage one, you are able to include limited uploads. The only mandatory upload is your references, which is limited to a single page. Um, and you can include a single supporting document, which could be something like a flow diagram, a letter of support, or maybe a response to previous re received feedback, if this is a resubmission, or if you're an existing or previous NIHR Global Health Research Award holder, you could also include a letter of support which highlights what that award has achieved and how that has benefited the end user of the research. So these awards that we are offering now require different leadership models. So we can either have a sole LMIC lead or joint leads from uh, LMICs or from an LMIC and the UK. Uh, one of those will be the contract holder and that person will be responsible for the submission on rounds. And it's important to note that there is only one, they will be the only person that will be able to submit the application. If you have joint leads, both joint leads will need to register on realms and complete tasks, but only the one who is the contract holder can submit the application. You can add the names of your co-applicants at stage one, um, but the co-applicants will not need to register and they complete any tasks uh, in realms via email. So they will be sent an email to basically agree that they're happy to be part of the application. Uh, they will need to access rounds at stage two. So if you're successful, please bear that in mind. And this can be the most problematic part of the application process, ensuring that you've got everybody complete, everyone's tasks completed and everyone has done what they need to do. So it's a good idea to let people know that they'll be required to do this when you ask them to join your team. Collaborators can be included in your research plans, but they don't need to be entered into rounds. So some tips for success. My first and most important tip is once again to read the guidance. Once you've read this, you'll have a clear picture of what is expected from your application. You must ensure that you meet the eligibility and remit in full and give a clear and full explanation of the research you wish to do and how you will complete it. You should include how this will be impactful and how this will make a difference. Make it clear how you've worked with your whole team, how you've engaged the joint lead and the co-applicants and what impact the local community voices have had. Make sure that you've engaged people like finance and your institution to ensure that you've got the right support and infrastructure in place. It's important to note that stage one applications are short, so be mindful of the space that you have and make your application concise and to the point. Don't have too many partners. You will have to be clear on how each one is involved. And if you're successful, you will need to ensure you have things like collaboration agreements with each. Make sure you write in plain English. 
The committees and reviewers of the applications come from all backgrounds and may not even have English as their first language. They do need to understand your application easily. You should make sure that you're clear on how your proposed study builds on anything you have done previously. And you should also be clear on how this differs and what aspects of it are new. You should include mentoring and support packages to help develop new leaders and new leadership models. And if your application is a resubmission, make sure you take into account any feedback you have received previously. Make sure all of your leads have registered on realms and completed the associated tasks, such as their personal profile and ORCID registration in good time. Leads not completing their tasks cause many issues when it comes to the submission deadline. So if you see a realms task, get it done. And make sure that you submit on time. Don't leave things to the last minute. The 1 p.m. deadline is UK time. So on to next steps. So let's go through your submission checklist. So have you got a clear application that meets the core specification set out in the guidance? Have you ensured you have met the eligibility criteria? Have you taken into account the advertised selection criteria? And have you included the required uploads? Now, don't include anything that hasn't been requested because we will remove it before the committee assessment. And if you have any questions, make sure you contact us. Uh, we are here to help you. So please drop us an email and we'll help you the best we can. So in conclusion, make sure you read the guidance in full. Yes, it's long and yes, there's lots of it, but I promise you it is all useful. Make sure your leads are registered on Round and on ORCID. If you have them, ensure both joint leads have completed their profiles and their associated tasks. The system will tell you if they haven't and it's up to the uh, contracting lead to check that these have been done. Don't miss the deadline. Realms will close at 1 p.m. and that's 1 p.m. UK time. We cannot change this and late submissions will not be accepted. So do not leave it to the last minute to submit. And finally, good luck. <laughs>